And we are now broadcasting. So Rabbi, it's all yours. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. And welcome to this evening of Jewish storytelling. Uh, we're going to be telling particularly poignant and sometimes difficult stories. Uh, but the truth of the matter is stories are at the heart of the Jewish faith experience. God, it seems, loves stories. And it has been our tradition from the very beginning, from the Torah itself, to tell those stories. The stories we're going to hear tonight are stories that combined tragedy and inspiration, sadness and joy, intertwined like a Havdalah candle. But in the end, such stories ultimately illuminate our lives and point in new directions for us to go as a people. That is what a good story does, and that is how it helps us move forward to push the darkness back and to reclaim the space with light through the story of our people, of our ancestors, and of our experiences. These guide us forward in perhaps the surest way we can imagine. So we are going to make our transition now from Shabbat to our time that we would consider to be profane and yet we're going to extend that holiness for a little while longer by uh, sanctifying them by sanctifying that time with stories but first havdalah so we begin with uh wine and we begin with a wordless melody and then we bless our wine and on from there to the sweet sense of the uh, of the spices and to the warmth of the light as the Shabbat is extinguished, we carry the light within us. <laughs> Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Bore peri hagafin Bore peri hagafin Shalom. 
Shavuato. 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 A good week, a week of peace. Let gladness reign and joy increase. A good week, a week of peace. Let gladness reign and joy increase. So, we have one last song to do, and that is uh, Eliyahu Hanavi. Eliyahu, of course, is the protagonist of so many of our stories. And these stories that we will hear tonight uh, reinforce to us and remind us how important it is that we contain and retain our hope for the future. And Eliyahu is the bearer of that hope. So we sing for his appearance and that all of these stories will finally find their fulfillment. Eliyahu Hanavi, Eliyahu Hatishpi, Eliyahu, Eliyahu, Eliyahu Hagiladi, Bimhera Bayamenu, Yavo Alenu, Imashi Afendavi, Imashi Afendavi, Eliyahu Hanavi, Eliyahu Hatishpi. Eliyahu, 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 Agiladi. And now I turn this over to our mistress of storytelling for this evening, Dr. Um, Deborah Fripp. Thank you, Rabbi. It started with a two-day workshop in January. 15 people gathered to learn how to tell stories of the Holocaust. What you are going to hear tonight is the product of that workshop and subsequent months of hard work, meeting in practice, to practice in person and by Zoom. I cannot tell you how proud I am to be able to bring you these storytellers and their stories tonight. Our first storyteller is Kathy Polakoff. She will be telling the story of Olympic gold medalist, Eva Seke, who was born in Budapest. She was already a renowned competitive swimmer at 14 when the Aerocross, the Hungarian fascist party, came to power with Nazi support. Three years later, in 1944, when the Nazis invaded, Eva and her family took shelter in a two-room safe house run by the Swiss, along with 41 other people. Kathy, it's all yours. Thank you. It's been a month. A month, can you believe it? a month since I won first place at the national swim meet with my team. <laughs> I mean, first place. I can't believe it. It was so amazing. And, and now I'm sitting here in my bed and I'm pretending to be sick and I have no idea why. Papa came running home and said the arrow cross were coming. And he said something to mama. And all of a sudden, she's telling me and my sister to hide. She's never done that before. And there wasn't any place for me to hide. I mean, no place big enough. So Papa said I should go upstairs and pretend to be sick in bed. And here I am thinking, what person is going to believe that I'm an invalid? I, 
Oh, I hear them coming. The they're banging around. They keep saying something about looking for children. Why children? They've never done that before. I mean, they take people all the time. Stupid things. Make them go and scrub sidewalks with toothbrushes. I don't understand, but it's always the grown-ups and and they they always almost always come back and and now they're coming up the stairs and suddenly I'm really frightened and as the door slams open I'm hiding my face toward the wall and I have the covers up to my chin and I'm trying not to move. The soldier says, I need to come with him. And Papa is pleading, begging, no, no, don't take her. Can't you see? Can't you see she's ill? Too ill to walk? And he just laughs. The man just laughs and says, that's okay. She only has to go to the river. And then he's pulling me again, and I'm so scared. And yet I can't help myself. I can't help wondering who goes swimming in the Danube in winter. And I don't want to go. I don't want to go. And he's pulling at the blankets. And, and then Papa says, no, he'll be glad you didn't take her. She's a famous swimmer. And all of a sudden, the man lets go. And I think, maybe Papa's a genius. And I hear the soldier ask me my name. And I look at his face. Eva. Eva Seke. I tell him. And then I quickly look away. Those eyes, they were two different colors, one gray, one brown. I, I, I've never seen anything like that. I didn't even know that was possible. And all of a sudden I realize they've left the room. I hear the arrow cross man say something about a credit to Hungary. And I think I, I just hope I never see that again, ever. And 100. Oh my God, 100. I think that's enough for today. Oh. <laughs> Mama keeps wondering why I'm doing this. But Mama, I have to stay fit. I have to stay in shape. They're not going to keep Jews from swimming forever. And when they let us swim again, I'm going to be at the front of the line. And to do that, I need to be fit, even if that means running up and down the stairs a hundred times a day, because there really isn't any other option. But every day it gets easier, and I know I'm in good condition for when I can swim again. And maybe, maybe someday I'll even swim in the Olympics. Maybe I'll even win gold. Wouldn't that be something? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe
maybe tomorrow I'll try for 101. I am hearing the cheers. I'm seeing the crowds. And I'm feeling the metal against my chest. I just won. <laughs> it's only an international meet, but it's good preparation for the Olympics. And then I hear the announcer say something about my being given a prize for my uh, for my contributions to Hungarian sports. That's nice. And then I see the man coming toward me with the trophy. And I see his eyes. I see his eyes, one gray, one brown. Oh my God, I know this man. I know this man. This is the man that stood in my bedroom all those years ago. This is the Arrow Cross man that wanted me to go with him to the river. If it hadn't been for Papa, he would have taken me and I would have died with all those other children. I think I might faint. And I look again and he's, he's handing me the trophy like nothing ever happened. And in the back of my mind, I hear my papa's voice. And I think, yeah, yes, I am a famous swimmer. In fact, I am an Olympic swimmer. I will take your trophy because I have earned it a thousand times over. But I didn't earn it for you. And I didn't earn it for Hungary. I earned it for me. Thank you, Kathy. That was marvelous, as always. Deep breath, everybody. Our next story comes from Rachel Lennard. Rachel will be telling the story of Eli Wiesel. When we begin Rachel's story, Eli is 15 or 16, and he is imprisoned in the Buna labor camp, not far from Auschwitz. Rachel, it's all yours. We just finished work for the day, and they've called us out for roll call. They told us that we can eat after roll call. Boy, are we all hungry. It's taking very long today. I don't know why, but it's taking very long today. A troop of SS soldiers has just come out and they've surrounded us. They have their machine guns pointing at us. It's like they're expecting trouble. What are we going to do? What kind of trouble are we going to cause? Two SS soldiers head to the solitary confinement cell and they bring out a young boy. No, they drag out a young boy. He's from Poland, Warsaw, Poland. He's been here a long time. You can see it in his face. He's hardened. He's not the same boy that he used to be. 
They drag him to in front of the judge, the head of the camp. And he says, what crime has this man committed? And they say, he stole food during the bombing of the Buna factory. That could have been me. I almost stole food. I could have been this boy. I could have had the fate of this boy. And the judge says, according to the law, you should be killed. And so I sentence you to death. Two fellow prisoners and an executioner drag him to the gallows. They force him to stand on top of a chair and put the rope around his neck. Two fellow prisoners, and they're doing it simply for more food. Two fellow prisoners. The young boy shouts, Long live liberty, my curse on Germany, my curse, my... They kicked over the chair before he could finish that last sentence. My friend Juliet turns to me and he says, how much longer is this going to take? I really want food. He doesn't even care that this young boy who's probably the same age as us, has just died. In order to get food, or even if we decide not to eat food, we have to walk by this boy and we have to stare at him in the face. They're making us all stare at him in the face. In his cold, dead face, with his cold, blank, empty, lifeless eyes. His swollen tongue is hanging out of his gaping mouth. There's no life left in his body, and I have to stare at him as if I was having a conversation with him, as if there was still life in, there, in his body, but there's not. We got food about five minutes later. That boy, he still haunts me. The smoke that I could see coming from Auschwitz not far away, the scent of the dead bodies, the fact that I knew people were dying around me, that's not what haunts me. What haunts me is that that young boy, he's who haunts me. The soup that night, it was the best soup of all the other nights. Thank you, Rachel. Our next storyteller is Joel Loeb. Joel will be telling the story of Liesl Joseph, his mother, who was from a small town in Rhineland. Her father was a prominent lawyer and her mother a society lady. Liesl was 10 years old when the horrors of Kristallnacht occurred and their lives changed forever. They were able to obtain passage to Cuba on one of the last ships out of Germany in May 1939, the MS St. Louis. That voyage came to be known as the Voyage of the Damned. Joel, it's all yours. Joel, we can't hear you. Can you try again? Is that better? Yes, perfect. Yay, okay. Thank you, Deborah. It's been six months since that horrible night when the Nazis came and destroyed everything, our house, our belongings, our lives. 
mommy and daddy sent me away all by myself to live with another family to be safe. Daddy was arrested and mommy had to work to get him out of jail. They made arrangements to leave Germany. I'm back home now and we're leaving Germany forever on a ship to Cuba where we will wait until we can move to the United States. But today we're in Berlin to say goodbye. Oma, my Oma, I don't want to leave you. Tantas, how can I leave you? I, I want you to come with us, please. I feel torn apart. We're leaving tomorrow. We're staying in a hotel tonight, a nice hotel in Hamburg. But there's a sign on the restaurant, no Jews allowed. You're not allowed to take German Reichsmarks onto the ship. So we'll find another place to eat. The men are busy outside working, loading ships and working at the docks. People from all countries speaking different languages, people of all colors. Today's Saturday, it's sunny, it's May 13th, and this ship is beautiful. It's big and so many flags. Here's the captain. Welcome into the MS St. Louis. Guten Tag, Herr Captain. Danke. Bitte schön. Everyone is so nice. It's like the old Germany. There's so many people on the ship, and they're all leaving for the last time. Mommy and Daddy said, as long as I'm on the ship, I can do what I want. I can go roller skating, I can go to the movies, and I can eat ice cream. It's gonna be lots of fun. It's been two weeks, it's very hot. People are starting to gather along the rails. I see Cuba, colored buildings. Mommy told me those trees are palm trees. They're beautiful, I've not seen one before. We're docked and ready and we're waiting and waiting and waiting. Something is wrong. That he said the Cuban president says we can't land here. Our landing permits are phony. A man just jumped off the ship. He's trying to kill himself. One of our sailors jumped in to save him and brought him back to the ship. There's so much confusion in the harbor. The captain has formed a passenger committee and my daddy's in charge. They're working with the captain and the American Joint Distribution Committee to find us a home. Cuba ordered us to leave. The ship is sailing between Cuba and Florida and, and in the United States. I see Florida. We're so close. Daddy and the passenger committee and the Jewish Joint Committee are trying to work with President Roosevelt so we can go to the United States. It's been five days and President Roosevelt says no. Daddy said, it's like Hitler told the world, nobody wants the Jews. Everybody is very scared. Today, Captain Schroeder is speaking to all of the passengers. We have to leave US waters and return to Europe. 
your passenger committee and the Jewish Joint Committee are close to another solution. And I make a promise to you, everyone, that I will never return you to Germany. It's been a month since we left Germany and we're sailing toward Europe. My daddy read a telegram with, with the passenger committee Working with Morris Troper from the Jewish Joint Committee, four countries have agreed to take the passengers from the St. Louis, Britain, France, Holland, and Belgium. Morris Troper will board the MS St. Louis in Belgium to greet the passengers. Daddy and mommy said, we're gonna go to Britain. We know people there. Everyone seems relieved and even excited. Finally, there's some hope. We're landing in Belgium. Mr. Troper is boarding the ship and everybody's gathering around because it's my 11th birthday today, June 17th. I was picked to greet Mr. Troper on behalf of the children. Here he comes. Most of the 900 passengers are here and waiting to to, to greet him. It's my turn. Mr. Troper, on behalf of all the children on the, on the S St. Louis, we thank you. We thank you for saving our lives. I wish we had flowers to give you, but there are none. But please know that we are so grateful. Today is June 18th. The passengers going to France, Holland, and Belgium have disembarked to travel to their chosen country. The ship seems so empty. There's a delivery for, it's for me. It's a big box. Mr. Troper sent me two dozen roses for my birthday. They're beautiful. It's my first flowers from a gentleman. We are departing for England. And mommy says we're gonna live in a small town in the country until our quota number comes up for the United States. Well, little did we know what was to come. We were people without a country with few belongings and little money waiting for a quota number to go to the United States. But as long as I was with my mommy and daddy, I knew I was safe. Three months after our arrival, we moved to London and then the war started. My daddy was imprisoned as a German alien. He went to the Isle of Man and had to stay there until we leave the country. Mommy and I lived in a world of blackouts, air raids, bomb shelters, and darkness. I was evacuated with the other students and our teachers to a small town for safety. My mommy and I were apart for 10 months. After a year in England, our quota number did come up. We left Britain in the darkness on a train. Daddy was in a sealed car in the back of the train as we traveled to Scotland so we, to set sail for the United States. We sailed for many days. The moment we saw the Statue of Liberty all lit up, we knew we finally made it to America. Thank you, John. Our next storyteller is Violet Neff Helms, who will be telling the story of Sarah Chaya Blay of Poland, the second wife of Rabbi Schwager Willig, stepmother to his six grown sons, and mother to their only daughter, 
Esther Rivka. Violet and I learned this story from Esther Rivka's daughter, Malki, who was our guide at Yad Vashem. Violet, it's all yours. I am so happy. Our Rivka has finally said that she will marry. She has, we've known this young man for several years now, and her father chose him special for her. And she said he was wonderful and, and we love him. And we're happy now that she's 17 and she's finally able to go on and make a home for herself. Things have been so hard here in Poland. The Russians have come in and they've made us move out of our homes. We're living in, in a workshop now, but that doesn't matter because we're still helping the community. We're still doing the job that a rabbi should do and a teacher should do, and that's all that matters. And so these moments, these times when we can share the happiness of our family, share that happiness with the community, ah, oh, it means the world, it means the world. The Russians not only have made us lose our homes and our properties and our communities, but they came to take our young men to be their soldiers. <clears throat> we are grateful because many of our young men were able to go to the forest and join the partisans and escape from all of this, but, but part of that was Israel our Esther's young man. The Russians took our properties and now the Germans have come in and they're taking our people too, but, but not to work. And the hardest blow of all, God has taken my husband. No, listen to me, Esther. Stand, stand. Please, please come. Come, no, ladies, move aside. Lester, listen, listen. I know, I know. That we're on this train. We don't know where the Germans are sending us, but we do know that we're together and that we stay together. If we just stay together and we do what we know to do, listen to me, listen to me. No, no, oh throwing my words back in my face. <sighs> yes, I know. I know our God has told us to choose life. And you are young. You are young. And Israel is out there somewhere. And there will be tomorrow for you. But, but please, please don't leave me. Please don't. I love you. I love you. <sighs> She jumped. She jumped. Oh. What? She is right. She is right and I have forgotten. I've taught her since she was a wee baby and she remembered even though all of the horror and the harshness and the hurting made me forget. My Esther remembered, God has told us to choose life and she did. Sisters, move tight. We have another desert to cross. Thank you, Violet. Deep breath, everybody. I want everybody to realize that none of these people are professional storytellers. You'd never know it, would you? But we did have the privilege of working with a professional storyteller. Jennifer Rudik Zunikov of Baltimore 
came out to Dallas in January to lead our workshop. Since then, she has been an invaluable resource for all of us in our development as storytellers. So we want to pause here and thank her for starting us on that journey. Our next storyteller is Rebecca Fripp. She will be telling the story of Mira Suava, who at the time the story begins is a 12 year old Polish Christian living in Krakow, Poland. The story starts when her aunt brings over a young girl, approximately Mira's age, right after the Krakow ghetto is cleared. Rebecca learned this story from Mira when Rebecca was in Poland with her high school class last year. Well, first, thank you. I have a new sister. <laughs> well, I think she's not exactly my sister. We're not related by blood, but she's my sister. I like the sound of that. Her name's Mir. Her name's Miriam. She goes by Mary, though, and I'm Mira. Mary, Mira. It's like we were destined to be sisters. And, and we are. Yeah, Mary and Mira, we're sisters. I like the sound of that. It's been about a week since my new sister came along. And Mama and Papa, they've been secretive lately, I guess. I often hear them talking in low whispers in their early morning or late at night after they think we've gone to bed. And I hear some, huh, what's that? Something about Mary? Wait a moment, baptized? Why would Mary need to be baptized? I was baptized when I was a baby. Shouldn't she have been baptized? Oh dear, I don't think I want to want Mama or Papa to hear that. Know that I've been eavesdropping. Let's go ask Mary, shall we? <sighs> hey, Mary, can I ask you a question? Why didn't we baptized? Her face goes as pale as the sheets of her bed that she is sitting on. She's frozen stiff. I thought for a second she had died or something because, wait, why is she so scared about this question? It's a simple question. Maybe she doesn't want me to be here. I'll leave. I wasn't born Christian. I stop when I hear that sentence. Wasn't born Christian. Okay, so what? You're not like me. Why do you, why do you become Christian? She continues with, because I'm Jewish. Right now it's dangerous to be a Jew. So I need to become Christian, at least for now, so I can be safe. <laughs> okay. Let's go get you Christian. <laughs> nice. <laughs> well, she was successfully Christianized, as my younger self would say. It's been a few years since me and Mary since Mary came along. It's dangerous now. There's been bombs going everywhere. Warsaw, small cities near Krakow. It's as if 
Hitler's gonna lose. It's as if Maria can become safe again. I think everything's great. And then loud, harsh, sounding knocks come onto the door. Mama and Papa are about that. Don't knock like that. What? Like, <laughs> ever. We both look at each other. Look back at the door. They come again. Are they going to kick down the door if we don't open it? Mama and Papa wouldn't like that very much. So I open the door. And there in front of me are two German Nazi soldier boys, about Mary my age. They shove past me harshly and go and start going around the room. One of them stays by the door. Machine holding tightly to his machine gun, staring at us, making sure that we don't do anything reckless. The other goes to the curtain and windows, starts closing them one by one. I quickly go next to Mary. At first, all there is is the rustling of the curtains being closed and the shivering of Mary next to me. She's terrified. I don't blame her. So am I. We are quiet for a moment. And that's when I ask again the rusty German that I always have. I'm Polish. I'm not German. I don't know German. And I never want to know German. But I ask, and as much German as I know, why are you here? Can we help you? The one rustling the curtain, closing the curtains, looks at me and turns back to closing the curtains, ignores me. The other one looks at us up and down, up and down for saying, he's closing the curtains so you, you pretty ladies won't get hurt when the bombs go off. But hey, while he's closing the curtains, two guys, two girls in a room, what could go wrong? Wanna talk? I shiver in disgust, but I don't say anything. The other one, the other boy finishes closing the curtains, looks at us up and down, up and down. Looks at the other soldier boy, rolls his eyes, then leaves, and then leaves. The, soldier, the other soldier boy following in suit. The only remains that they actually came was the petrification in Mary's posture and the closed curtains. It's been years since the war. It's been years since we had a hype Mary. She's now a Jew again. It's been years since Hitler. <coughs> Mary and her family are off in Israel. Here I am, still in Poland, telling my story to the next generation so they don't make the same mistake that the Nazis did, so that they will learn from the past. And that's what I'm doing today telling the story to a large group of American teenagers, male and female, with a few adults sprinkled in here, sprinkled in there. And I told my story. After I tell my story, I always open the floor for questions. There's no one question that is always asked. It's always different. 
But there's often a question that stays with me. And this time, there was a question from one of the teenagers, a female. She asked, you knew it was dangerous to hide Mary. You knew you could have gotten killed, yet you did anyway. You faced the risk and kept going. Why? I simply smile, say, because it was the right thing to do. I'm no hero for doing this. I just saw what had to be done and I did it. Thank you, Rebecca. Our next storyteller is Judith Bernstein. She will be telling the story of Saren Tuval, who, when we meet her, is in her early 20s. She was taken into custody for labor details with her younger sister, Esther, and their two co-workers, Ellen and Lily. They had all worked together in a seamstress shop in Budapest. After weeks of hard labor, they were transported in a cattle car for over three weeks without food or water to the camp where we find her. Judith, it's all yours. Thank you, Deborah. We are trudging. It's been almost all day. We're marching, more like dragging our feet. We were on the train for three weeks and I'm so tired and thirsty. Well, there's a gate up ahead, big iron gate. It says Ravensbrook. Ravensbrook, and there's a sculpture, an iron sculpture of a, a bug, a louse. Oh. And as we go through the gates, nach rechts, nach links, nach rechts, nach links, go right, go left, go right. Lily and Ellen and Esther and I went right. And we came inside of a room, as like a, just a, Plain room with some benches along the side and puddles of water on the floor. I'm so thirsty I could I could get down and lick the water off the floor. <sighs> Take off all your clothes. Achtung, achtung! Take off all your clothes and fold them, put them on the floor beside you. You're gonna have a bath. A bath, Lily says to me, can you believe it? We've been on the work detail for so long that our body secretions and the dirt and grime, they've all just embedded into us. And my hair, can't even get my fingers through it. When I was a girl, a younger girl, I used to love to wash my hair two or three times a week and just feel it dry and soft along my back. My hair's blonde and it was so beautiful and now I can't even get my fingers through it. Maybe they'll give us combs too. Achtung! Put your shoes next to you. The other women didn't understand German so I translated for them. Some of them held their garments in front of them as if it was going to protect us. But the guard stared. And eventually we all just dropped the last remnants that were ours. The guards are coming in with a basket or a box or something now. And they're just like throwing a dress at each one of us. It doesn't matter if it fits mine. It's thin and the waist comes down to here. But I see Esther's got a green wool one. That'll keep her warmer. It's got holes in it, but at least she'll be warmer. But wait. 
before we put the dresses on. The guards came in, two guards came into the room, one with a great big scissors and the other one with a basin of water and a razor blade. And they started at the beginning of the first row and just started cutting off the hair of the woman and tossing the hair into black or auburn or blonde pile. And they did Ellen's and they did Lily's and they did, they grabbed me by the head. She grabbed me and pulled it really hard, like by the roots. And she goes, ah, look at this one. Like, what does she mean? Look at this one, because it's blonde or because it's disgustingly dirty. And she starts to saw. It was like I could just see that even the scissors that she had could barely cut through my hair. And she cut all the way around my head. She just lifted my hair off and threw it into the pile of blonde hair. I could just see it falling, falling off the pile. And she cocked her foot and kicked it back up into the pile. My hair. They cut off our hair, all of our hair. And then they brought us the dresses. And now they're coming with coats. And it, at least mine's long and it's got pockets and the sleeves are longer than mine fingers so I can pull them up and warm them a little bit. Achtung, they said, go off into that building. You're going to get some soup. So, so we try to go through the doorway and they're swinging and hitting at the other women as they go through. The four of us were able to sneak through without getting hit and we get in a line. And they gave us a tin cup. And as I'm going through the line, the girl on the other side takes a ladle and she starts to pour the soup in my cup and she sees a piece of meat and puts that on a plate and then pours the rest of the broth and a turnip in my cup. I haven't had anything to eat or drink this week. And they gave us a piece of bread. And they said, go that way, go into that room. And we get in the room and they say, four women to a bunk, four women to a bunk. Everybody get in a bunk. And Ellen goes, I want to go on the bottom. I'm so tired. And I looked around and I said, oh, no, not the bottom bunk. We're going to the top. But I'll spill my soup. Then drink your soup first. And so we did. We drank our soup first. And then I helped them up and we climbed up to the pot top. It was just barely enough space for the four of us to squeeze in head to foot to foot to head a little bit of straw and it's cold oh i wish they hadn't made us leave our backpack on the train we had our quilt and our blanket it would be so much warmer my hair lily and Esther, Ellen, finally drift off to sleep amidst the moans of the other women. And every time I close my eyes, I see my hair falling off the pile. And I can't fall asleep. This wretched life. Don't hit me! So, see the pal! See the pal! Schnell! Schnell! They say, get up! Get up, you Jew bitches! Get up and go outside! Get outside! They grab my shoes, take the strings and put them around my neck and climb down. Climb down to the floor, slip my feet in the shoes, and we go outside and line up, and it's, it's still. Dark, it's dark, so dark. I don't even know, I can hardly see the woman in front of me. They're counting us. 
been an hour and they're still counting like they can't get the number right. So cold. I can barely wiggle my toes inside my shoes. Oh, that I still had Samuel's pants and my wool socks to keep me warm. Oh, it's so cold. It's starting to get a little lighter. I can see the guards, two guards carrying something out of the great building that we slept in. Can't tell what it is. Oh, an arm just dropped. It's a dead woman. They're taking her body and they just fling it thud against the building. More guards coming out with another and another. And they're stacking them. 16 women high, and five bodies long. I am not going to be one of those women. I am going to do everything that I can be as clever and as smart as I can and do everything that I can so that I can survive. And Ellen and Lily and Esther can survive. I will not die, but live. Thank you. Thank you, Judith. <laughs> Deep breath, everybody. Our next storyteller is Neil Borg. He's going to tell the story of his mother, Rena Bourgeois, and her wartime experience as a hidden child in rural France. Neil, it's all yours. Deborah. Thank you, Deborah. The year is 1994. My mother is living in Chicago with our family. She's working at the JUF, the Jewish United Fund, downtown Chicago, and gets to be friendly, good friends with several of the ladies that work there. And as time go on, they get to know my mom and get to know a bit of her story as a hidden child. They urged my mother to tell her story to the Steven Spielberg Foundation. They were making the documentaries for the Shoah Foundation. And at first, my mom was really reluctant. She didn't feel she had a story that was relevant. She didn't feel she had a story worth telling. But eventually, she agreed. And um, one morning, the interviewer shows up with a cameraman and they sit down uh, in my mom's and dad's apartment and she begins to tell the story. The interviewer asks, what's the earliest thing you remember of your life on the farm? My mother says she recalls a night when her father Nathan and her mother Nina were up in the middle of the night. They, um, they uh, my grandfather had just been to a farmer's market where he had run into a friend of his from the army. The man's name was Lucian Tulow. He looks up and sees Lucian, and Nathan says, Lucian, how are you? How have you been? Of course, Lucian was not very happy with the situation with the Nazis being in Paris. And Lucian says to Nathan, I've been okay. How have you been? Nathan is very, very concerned. He says to Lucian, I have nowhere to put my family. I'm trying to hide, but you know I'm Jewish. I have uh, nowhere to go. I know they're coming, and I've been trying to find a place to hide my family. And Lucian looks at Nathan without hesitation and says, Nathan, bring your family to my farm. 
it's in the country. We'll hide your family. We'll take care of you. We'll keep you safe. Well, the look on Nathan's face must have been incredible. For months, he had tried to find a secure place to keep his family. And now he may have found the answer to his, uh, to his dilemma. So uh, the next week, again, my mom recalls middle of the night, my grandfather and grandmother preparing bicycles. They had packed a few things. My grandfather attached a sidecar to one of the bicycles. And under the cover of darkness, in the middle of the night, they take off. It's a cold night. It's very dark. They take off to the countryside. They arrive at the farm. And my mother recalls uh, that night, truly not understanding the implications of what was going on. But over time, she tells the interviewer that she really enjoyed farm life. She enjoyed the routines, the collecting of eggs, the tending to cows, keeping the garden. She really uh, looked back on those days as being great. She was one of three daughters uh, that the two Lowe's had. She just fit in as the fourth daughter. She went to school. She attended church at school. It was a one-room schoolhouse. And she made a very close friend. The woman's name was Nicole. They did everything together. They went to school. They hung out. They played together. One day, my mom recalls that Nicole had asked my mom if she would come with uh, Nicole's family that night to the church. There was a big celebration. Maybe it was Easter or maybe it was Christmas. My mom didn't recall. But she goes to the church with the family and is very impressed. Everybody stands up at the same time. Everybody sits down at the same time. Everybody knows the songs. She's very impressed with the service. And afterwards, there's a sleepover at Nicole's house where she just has a really great time. And she recalls to the interviewer that that could have been, at that moment, the best day of her life. As time goes on, the war drags on. It's nearly over, and my grandfather is sick. He uh, is bedridden. He uh, is pale. He is in need of medicine, a doctor, but no, no doctor would come out to help a Jewish man. And my mom recalls sitting with her mother at his bedside, at Nathan's bedside, him being unresponsive and uh, terrible color. And they basically sat there. Uh, he was, uh, she was at his bedside when he passed away. With Nathan gone and the war over, there was nothing left for them in France. My grandmother had purchased tickets on a ship to make sail to the United States. My mother recalls the travel as being rough seas, close quarters, terrible food, and just a long journey. When they finally arrive in the United States, she recalls going to school not knowing a word of English, being picked on by the children. It was a very unhappy time for my mother. Years later, we have this tape. We watch it periodically, but a cousin who was living in Paris took a copy of the tape and knew the name of the family. He knew the location of the family and started to do some research to find the family that hid my mother. It didn't take very long. The family was still living in Kubiak. They were still there. The woman, Madame Toulot, 99 years old when he found her. Well, without hesitation, he tried to put together a plan to recognize the family and to commemorate what they did. He took a copy of the tape and sent it to Yad Vashem in Israel. And a second copy went to the state of France. All the documentation was there. Without hesitation, Yad Vashem in Israel deemed the family righteous among the nations. 
and decided that it would be appropriate for them to receive the Righteous Among the Nations Medal. This, the country of France also recognized their heroism and, and would award the family the uh, Legion d'Honneur. It's the highest civilian award available to a French citizen. My cousin who put this uh, award ceremony together really insisted, gladfully so, that I attend with my sons, Andrew and Elliot, and with Eileen. We get on a plane, we head to Toulouse, France, where we're met by a driver. The driver picks us up, takes us to this small town in the countryside of Kubiak. When we approach the house where my mother was hidden, the driver suggests that we get out and we walk the last hundred yards, right around the corner, he says. So we get out of the car, we start to walk, and as we turn the corner, we can see there's a group of people standing in front of the house. As we get closer, I can see one of the guys is a newsman, and he's got a camera on his shoulder, and there's an interviewer. As we get very close to the group, an older woman, she may have been 80 years old or so, walks in front of the group and approaches me. And I look at her and I know that face. I had seen pictures of this face. She looks at me, it's Nicole. She comes up to me, she puts her hands on my face and she says, I haven't seen this face in so long. The beautiful face of my friend, Rena, you look just like your mother. Well, needless to say, it was a river of tears. My sons and I and, and Eileen uh, had quite a cry. The cameraman with his camera in, in my face says to me, how are you feeling right now? And I said, this is really an out of body experience. I can't believe I'm looking at the house. I'm in front of the place where my mom was hidden. Anyway, we, we mill around and we talk to the other people, and now it's time to head to Toulouse where the award ceremony is going to occur. We get to Toulouse, and it's a beautiful square, the cobblestone street. There's a little farmer's market going on, uh, city hall, the building was beautiful, and there's a couple of restaurants where we sit down and we have a little snack before we get into the uh, city hall. And as we're sitting there, this chill comes over me. And I'm wondering to myself, is this the place in 1942 where the Nazis ordered the Jews to assemble? I could see ghosts with their, their suitcases and their, their tired faces waiting for transport to unknown places. That feeling passed and we paid our bill we go into the city hall and it's absolutely beautiful. It looked like the Sistine Chapel with the frescoes on the ceiling and the walls are painted beautifully. And as I walk into the room where the ceremony is gonna occur, I see Madame Toulot. She's sitting in her wheelchair. And as I approach her, she stands up. She recognizes me immediately. And I said to her, Madame Toulot, this is one of the greatest moments of my life, getting to meet you, getting to meet your daughters. It feels as if you gave not just me my life, but my children, their lives also. And she looks at me and she says, when I saw your mother, what I saw was a little girl that needed a home. I didn't see a little Jewish girl that needed a home. I just saw a, a girl. It was a moment I'll never forget. Thank you for listening to my mom's story. Thank you, Neil. These storytellers have really shown us the breadth of stories that come out of the Holocaust. We are very excited about this powerful new way to teach and learn about this very difficult subject. We are working to expand these programs in all directions, so if you are interested in participating in a storytelling program or in helping us develop one in a new place or in a new way, please get in touch with me at some point. Now we'll end with one last story um, 
That is the story that I will tell you, the story of Yitzhak Rudashevsky. Yitzhak is a teenager living in Vilna, Lithuania. He's about 15 when we meet him, maybe 14. But before we meet Yitzhak, we need to meet his cousin Sorka, who found his diary. My cousin's diary, I found it in the walls of the place where we were hiding after. <sighs> ah, Yitzhak, such a great writer, my Yitzhak. September 6th, 1941. Yitzhak! That's my mama calling. Yitzhak! It's time to go. They built a ghetto in Vilna, a ghetto where all the Jews are supposed to move into, leave our homes and everything we know, and move into this ghetto. I don't want to go. Yitzhak! It's time to go! but I guess I have to. So I pick up my bundle. Everything I can take with me in this one bag is really heavy. And I go down to the street, <sighs> join all the other people walking with their bundles. It's so far and I'm so tired. <sighs> the Germans have been here for three months and it's been bad. But this is the worst. I don't want to go to the ghetto. There's the gate. I feel as if I'm being robbed. I love these streets. But there's so many people. They just push me into the gate and into another gate that's blocked with these bundles that people have put down. So I put mine down. Oh, there's Mama. She says we need to go up to the apartment. Boy, this is a small space. 11 people plus us four in this one little apartment. Four families. Nobody is getting much sleep tonight. September 7th, our first day in the ghetto. I went out into the street but it's so crowded. There are swarms of people filling the streets. I feel as if I'm in a box. There's no air to breathe. Everywhere you go, you encounter a gate that hems you in. October 1st, 1941. There was another action in the ghetto today. There have been several. We've been hiding in a bunker, but this time, this time we got a yellow card. It allows us to go to the other side of the ghetto, the part where the actions aren't happening. My parents, my cousin Sarka and her family, my sister, we all got yellow cards. but not grandma, she didn't get one. I'll never forget how she reached out to us as we left. Take me with you, she seemed to say. October 5th, 1942. It's been a year, but at last I have lived to see the day. School started in the ghetto today. Math, science, languages, history. We're doing this ghetto folklore project. We're gathering blessings and curses, jokes and stories that already seem like legends. The story of the ghetto, 
is written in blood in these streets and I will collect it because it is a treasure for the future. November 5th, 1942, we went interviewing people for the Ghetto Folklore Project. We went down to Shaffler 4 to interview the family there. We did not get a good reception. We were reproached for having calm heads. You must not probe into other people's wounds, she said. Our lives, our lives are self-evident. January 8th, 1943. I had to make a decision today. I had to decide whether to stay in school or learn a trade. It would make a lot of sense to learn a trade, make some money, live in the ghetto. But I have decided that I will stay in school because I will live for tomorrow, not with today. Purim, 1943. You know, it's odd. I know I'm in the ghetto, but I have such a rich intellectual life, school, lectures to attend, meetings at the Clout, the Ghetto Folklore Project. I often forget that I'm in the ghetto. We had a porn party at the club today. We ate homentaschen, we had a porn play, we sang and we danced. Even the adults joined in. Everyone was so ready for porn. But we are waiting for the real porn. Next year, next year, we will eat Hitler Taschen. <sighs> My poor Yitzhak. Never got to see another porn. September of that year, 1943, there was another action in the ghetto. They cleared the ghetto. We hid, his family and mine, for two weeks we hid, but they found us. I escaped, I don't quite know how, ran to the forest, joined the partisans, but Yitzhak, my parents, were murdered at Ponar. But Yitzhak, it's over. It's over, the Germans are gone and we are still here. And I, I will eat Hitler Taschen for you. On behalf of all of the storytellers, thank you very much for listening. Um, we're going to, I'm going to um, unmute all of our storytellers and um, <laughs> um, and open the, the floor for questions if you want. There's a chat open and a Q&A open, so if um, anybody has questions, for the storytellers, uh, feel free to ask us and we'll hang out for a few minutes uh, while we do that. So, um, uh, Hans says we all did a wonderful job. Thank you. Thank you very much, thank Hans. You. Thank you. Thank you, Hans. Thank you. Danke. <laughs> One of the questions we often get asked is where do, how do we decide on our story? <laughs> and um, I think that's a very interesting point because each of these stories was chosen because it spoke to one of us that we each chose the story we chose because it somehow connected to us. It connected to 
to our own lives in some way. And this storytelling, one of the things about it is it is the place where the, their lives and ours intersect. And that is how these stories begin to come into our present rather than merely being a little bit of the past. And we hope that you felt that too. Um, we have a question. It's not a question. It's yeah. a, um, thank yes. you. That was unique and moving. Thank, thank you for sharing these stories, says Joan. <laughs> um, Michael asks, do you feel exhausted telling these stories? Can I answer this one? Yeah. Um, go ahead, Rebecca. Mute yourself, please. Otherwise, look okay. No, just oh, speak it with. Fine. <clears throat> Here. It's okay. Fine. Um, sort of. I mean, I guess there's a recoil after telling the stories of it's, I guess it's just tiring emotionally due to how it's... <laughs> we, we lost everybody. Um, how it's so emotional. So it's, I guess it's draining emotionally. However, I like to think that it's also in the same way not exhausting at all because we are able to bring to life people who uh, who cannot bring their own stories to life. I know a lot of the a lot of people here stories are of people who are already dead. And for example, and like mine, my story most sorry, I'm guessing everybody here would not be able to understand hers because she only could speak Polish. But it's the ability to bring alive the stories that is something that I do not find exhausting at all. At all. However, the emotions that they bring are absolutely exhausting. My story is part of me. You know, it formed my life. It's, it's about my mother. Um, and I don't even know what my father's story is. Mm. But it's not exhausting, it's emotional. <laughs> and it's an emotion that you live with. Um, I want to show, I don't know if everybody else got to see, um, uh, from Jennifer, what an incredible gift. You each crafted your stories so beautifully. Thank you for honoring the survivors and the Jewish people. Thank you, Jennifer. That means a lot coming from you, especially. Um, so from another listener, you have to tell a very small piece of a much larger story. How do you choose what small piece tells the whole? Oh. Yes, Violet, give us the answer to that one. Well, it started with... Um, what just was burned into my brain when Malka told us the story of her mother. And it was her mother who jumped from the train. And I thought of that for a long time. And then it hit me about her mother, Esther, talking with her mother. And being a mother, I thought, oh my word, what an absolutely heart-wrenching thing to happen. How did she handle it? And that's why I went back and I read the story. And it all started, like I said, with the part on the train when Esther jumped from the train. And that made me work backwards. And that's why I wanted to bring the whole story that their life wasn't, didn't begin and end in that one little train. There was a time before. How did they get there? That's why I chose the, chose those scenes. Marvelous, Judith. Uh, I chose this story. This is obviously a, a whole memoir. It covers many years, but I chose the story as my first one because it included the moment at which Saren decided to live, at the moment mm -hmm. be a survivor, which for me was a contrast to myself in the way that I figured if I had been alive during that time, I probably would not have had the strengths that so many people had to survive. And now that I have gotten to this point, my next stories will be maybe describing some of those things that Theron did that 
that made a difference and that did help her survive and helped her to have a, an awareness around her that, that made things work. And there's lots of stories in there too, but this one was the one that I needed to feel first in order to know that it was a conscious decision. Rachel, why don't you tell us why you chose your story? Um, so I have... <laughs> Let me turn down the speaker, Rachel. Okay. Well, I have um, been working on the Ellie uh, Fizel novel, reading it and working on the story, knowing the story for several years now. And that one part, uh, both of the times that I read it is the one part that it kept me up at night and it was a story that you can connect to without actually having to be there. And I felt that that was the story that best, uh, that I could best tell and best needed to be told. Mm. Mm. Um, Michael, Michael had a really nice point, which is, um, you know, we've all heard Ellie Wiesel's story. And we, those of us who were lucky enough to see him in real life, um, we heard it from an old man. And to hear it from a, a teenager, somebody who's about the same age that he was at the time is really yeah. remarkable. Um, so thank you for, for sharing that with us, Rachel. Um, any other comments or questions? Um, could I say something, please? Yes. You made a good point. Because too often when we think about uh, that period of time, we think of adults and how the adults handled things. But when you look back at the stories that of Joel and um, of um, Neil, th these were children that went through these things. And we have to remember that. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. um, a number, a lot of these stories we're telling, we're telling stories about, about young people and children and um, we're used to hearing them from, from much older people and, and it's, it's nice to get the breadth. I yes. also, like I said before, I love this group of stories because it really gives us the breadth of stories that you get um, from, from the Holocaust. And it's a much broader group of stories than we usually think of. It's, it's a much broader group of people, and we begin to realize just how different the people who experienced the Holocaust were from each other. Um, there was no cookie cutter. No. no. Kathy, no. yes. Uh, just adding to that, you know, the reason I picked the story I did was partly because it was so unique. It wasn't just about trauma and tragedy. It was about survival and success and mm -hmm. joy and pride in your accomplishments. And I think one of the things that gets forgotten is how these people didn't just survive it. They went on to live very full lives, those that did survive. And I don't think that, I worry that that gets lost in translation too often. Yes. And thank you, Kathy. You did a beautiful job of showing us what life after looked like and felt like. Um, I want to thank all of these storytellers for all of their hard work. I want to thank all of you who are listening for coming and listening. Um, stay safe, stay healthy, stay inside, and good night. Thank you, Deborah. 
I just want to thank you all for being part of my family for the past four weeks. Thank you. And, uh, thank you. I am, you know, this for me was the blessing of the, the coronavirus. <laughs> I would have been, would have been left out of, of this amazing project and um, I hope we can keep going and I feel like I have created much deeper relationships with the, the, the eight or nine of you that are here and um, from being in, uh, so far from the congregation, it really has, has made a lot of uh, right. uh, sense for me. So thank you all for being my friend. Ditto. My feelings, yeah, exactly. Too. Mine too. You could not have said that any better. All right. Absolutely. Yeah. Agreed. Okay.